Good morning. Welcome to All Saints. We're delighted that you're here with us this morning. Um, everything you need for worship is in these pages. Um, the front part is the announcements. You can um, set that aside and save it for later. Um, the inside are all the directions you need for worship, um, including directions for receiving communion. Here at All Saints, everyone is welcome to come and receive communion. Um, and the directions in here tell you exactly how we do that. Um, at this time, we invite um, our children to go to Children's Church led by the cross. <laughs> Let us take a moment to quiet ourselves and prepare for worship. <laughs> blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. With you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshiped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. There was a certain man of Ramathiam, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanon, Elkanah, son of Jerum, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Aphromite. He had two wives, and the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions of his wife Penina and to her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. So often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? <coughs> After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. 
She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate, and drank with her husband, and her countenance was, no, was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. The man Elkanah and his household all went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and remain there forever. I will offer him as a Nazarite for all time. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with the three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. She brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. They slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me the petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is given to the Lord. She left him there for the Lord. The word of the Lord.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine, after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> what a beautiful story we hear from 1 Samuel this morning. A woman who could have no children is considered inadequate and scorned by all, except her husband, because he has another wife to give him children. The barren wife prays to God, begging to God to give her a male child so that she will have some value in the eyes of the community. She makes a deal with God to give him back her son, if only she can give birth to him. God grants her prayer, and so the woman takes her son to the temple and leaves him there as soon as he's able to eat solid food. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Maybe not so much. This text highlights the challenge we always face when approaching scripture. Some stories have become so familiar to us and their interpretations so often repeated that we forget the chasms of time, cultural difference, and language that we are crossing every time we open the book, which actually isn't even a book except for the way we bound it today. So what do we do with Hannah? For starters, we give thanks for a woman whose name was remembered and even written down. That is so rare that it alone tells us that this story was deeply important to the people of Israel. Like Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, Hannah is the mother of a forerunner. Her son Samuel would become a prophet and judge who would proclaim the coming of a king. At God's command, Samuel would anoint Saul, the first king of Israel. Secondly, the story of Hannah is one of great trust and faithfulness to God. After taking her son Samuel to the temple, Scripture tells us that she sang a hymn. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven. But she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up from poor, the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Does that hymn sound familiar? We heard it just a few weeks ago on the lips of Mary when she stood before Elizabeth and told her what God had promised. Hannah's hymn is an early vision, version of what we now know as the Magnificat. Hannah was a spiritual forebear of Mary, perhaps someone that Mary even thought of as she pondered the life she carried. 
Now we know that until very recently, women were valued for their ability to bear children, period. This is an idea that we adamantly reject in our day. Or do we? The average age at which women are having children is going up, and more women are choosing not to have children. But many of us know that there is still a stigma against women who are not mothers. This is particularly painful for women who long for biological children, but are not able to get or remain pregnant. Perhaps Hannah's story is not so distant after all. Begging God for the gift of a child is as real today as it was then. And I'm sure that well-meaning husbands still ask, am I not more to you than 10 sons? It still is difficult to connect though with the visceral, tangible way in which Hannah's trust in God is lived in the midst of her disgrace. She looks to God alone to satisfy her longing, not scientific advancements or even old wives' tales as far as we know. Israel's connection to God was very close. God was bigger and greater than what they could grasp, but not distant. The clothes they wore, the prayers they hung on their doorposts, the meals they ate, were all a physical, immediate interaction with God. The bargain Hannah makes with God is equally literal, as remarkable as Mary saying yes to the angel Gabriel's message is Hannah's physical returning her son to the temple. How could she do that? It seems completely absurd to us. For Hannah, it was certainly a great act of faithfulness but one that sat within the practices of her culture. As you know, having made it this far through the Bible, much of Israelite worship was about making offerings to God. Animals, grains, fruit, and vegetables were all offered to God. Just as we give a guest the first choice at a meal and the best of what we have to offer, God was given the first fruits of each flock, herd, and harvest. In return, God's people trusted that God would bless them with greater returns from fields, flocks, and f herds. I lost track of where they all came from. Again, there are some cultural differences we're jumping here. Hannah's pr promise to God was the same promise that her people made every season. She and her husband took their son Samuel to the temple as they would have a young lamb. Eli, the priest, accepts the offering and raises Samuel to be a prophet. Hannah's offering is honored by God, and she is given many more children, three sons and two daughters. Her shame is forgotten. We live a long way from Hannah's re reality in many ways. The kind of exchange with God that the Israelites practiced makes no sense in our world. Though we still have remnants of it, we talk about offerings of time, talent, and treasure, and sometimes we even talk about God increasing our prosperity if we first give to God. There's a whole religious stream that has grown up around that idea. It's not very Episcopalian, though. But think about Hannah today as our offering plate. Offerings are placed in the plate and carried to the altar, along with bread and wine, all of them representing our lives. Are there ways that we can deepen that experience so that it brings us closer to the faithfulness of Hannah, perhaps without abandoning our modern understandings of the universe? We are gathered here on the first day of the week. We are, in fact, offering the first hours of our week to God. We know that in the backs of our minds, but don't often think of it that way. At least I don't. But if we did, if we just reoriented our intention a little, to make Sunday morning more than just the cyclical rotation of our work week, we might find even greater significance in our time here of the offering of our time to God. I imagine that like most of you, most of us, you pay your pledge to the church whenever you sit down to pay your bills. You pull an offering out of your wallet as the plate comes toward you. In the past few months, we have talked a lot about our offerings to all saints as an act of faithfulness to God, and you have responded generously, putting us over our projected budget. To continue that act of offering, 
Try writing your pledge check first or setting aside your Sunday offering. Make it the first thing you pay or do, maybe even at the beginning of the month or the quarter. Make it the first fruits of your labor that you return to God. Prayer can work the same way. In the Book of Common Prayer, morning prayer opens with the versicle, Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. This comes from Psalm 51 and is a promise that the very first things we say each day will be praise for God. Whether you have a set time for prayer or pray as the need arises, it might be a powerful start to the day if as you're getting out of bed or even before, you begin with thanks to God. What other ways might we offer the first and best of our lives to God? They can be as varied and unique as each of our lives. It's not magic, of course. This is where the prosperity gospel folks go awry. God does not, in fact, promise that if we give the church money on the first of the month, that we will have more than we expected at the end. At least that's not the way my bank account works. There is something, though, to redirecting our attention toward God that can bear fruit in unexpected ways. Being generous simply makes us happier. Every study shows it. And starting with generosity breeds more generosity. It is a sublime circle rather than a vicious one. Turning our attention to, toward God also breeds greater attention to God, oddly enough. Hannah's life is literally ages away from our own, but her trust in God is a valid example for us. I invite you to also look for concrete ways to imitate that trust in your life here and now, because trusting God is simply a better way to live. Amen. Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, God of all peoples and places, 
To you we offer gratitude and praise. Strengthen us for service and receive our heartfelt prayers. Where there is darkness, illumine us to be light in the world. Where there is suffering, gentle us to embody the love which heals. Where there is division, move us to nurture new connections and inspire us to be a presence of harmony. Where there is indifference towards nature, deepen our awareness of the relational essence of creation and embolden us to be protectors and lovers of life. Where there is dysfunction in our government and politics, may we form a more sacred union through charitable speech and through the higher wisdom of our hearts. Where there is conflict, fill us with compassion, enough to meld our greed and humility, enough to silence our ego. And may each one of us be a great blessing of peace. We pray for faithful people everywhere and for the church, especially for the bishop's search in our diocese. Where your Holy Spirit invites growth, open us to listen and to commit to a daily spiritual practice that we may discover our true divine self. Hear, O oh God, the concerns of Howard, Nico, Tamara, Catherine, Virginia, Dorothy, Marty, Emily, Matthew, Dixie Lee, Katie, Karen, Gordon, Rosemary, Chuck, Janine, Greg, and the needs of people gathered. Remembering all who have died, especially Barb Woodward, in whose loving memory the altar flowers are given by the Woodward and Houseman families, and those we now name. May all departed souls, O God, return in glory to your resplendent light. O God, Remind us that everywhere we look, our gaze finds a glimpse of you. May the light in all sentient beings brightly shine, and may our daily lives be dedicated to your purpose, knowing we are formed in your image. And Lord, reveal Christ. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. Forgive us, Lord, for we have not loved you with our whole heart. Forgive us, Lord, for we have not loved you with our whole heart. Forgive us, Lord, for we have not loved you with our whole heart. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring you to eternal life. Amen. Please stand. And my brothers and sisters, the peace of Christ be always with you. Good morning, beloved All Saints. As a member of the Vestry, which is the governing board of our church, I welcome you to All Saints and I invite you, if you have any questions, um, I'm dressed very colorfully today so that you can find me and ask questions. Some important announcements for today. If you're visiting with us, you can find a, a pew card, and uh, we ask that you just fill that out and put it in the collection plate. And that's the only offering that we ask of you today so that we can uh, greet you and thank you for coming. And then right after the service, join us for coffee downstairs in fellowship uh, in the room that's directly beneath us. And you can reach that room through the stairs or there is an elevator as well. So some important announcements to highlight from the bulletin, but I do urge you also to read the bulletin, the bulletin announcements. Um, the adult formation today is Samuel was a prophet and we can be one too. And Valerie Smith and, uh, I mean Valerie Smith and Gretchen Smith will look at the life and words of a contemporary prophet, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and with regards to what the letter from a Birmingham jail says about how we can respond to incidents of racism, sexism, white nationalism, religious intolerance, sanctuary for immigrants, and gun violence. And this will be held in the lounge at 1130. And next week there is no adult forum because we will be having our All Saints annual meeting 10 o'clock right after the service um, downstairs in the Undercroft. We will be announcing the uh, vestry candidates and their names and biographies are posted on the bulletin board outside the church office and also on the church website. Uh, get going with outreach. As we kick off 2019, we want to focus on serving our wider world in Jesus' name. Join the outreach team, now headed by Joe Hartwell and our deacon candidate, Annette Molesky, as we make plans for the year ahead. If you've been wanting to make a difference, here's your chance, and we will be meeting on Tuesday, February 5th at 6.30 in the church library. Uh, today at Coffee Hour, please help support, support the civil rights of immigrants with the annual Valentine's Dinner and Dance. It starts at 6.30 to, on Saturday, February 9th at Cristo Ray Church. This is a fundraiser sponsored by Civil Rights for Immigrants Task Force of Action of Greater Lansing. And you can immerse yourself in Latino culture, food, and music while you show your support for our immigrant, friend, immigrant friends and neighbors at this family-friendly event. Tickets are available today um, in the Undercroft after the service during coffee hour. And for more information, you can contact Paulette Johnston. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Janet. We have a special guest with us today uh, who will be doing our ministry minute. Eric Travis is the Missioner for Youth and Young Adults from the Diocese of Michigan. After the service, he's going to be meeting first with our middle school youth, and then a little later um, after that with the high school confirm not conform youth. Um, before I introduce him, I want to make a note. High school youth and leaders, yes, take communion first and go to your class. Middle school youth, Please stay through till the end of the service and then meet with Donna and Eric after the service is over today. So high schoolers, leave at communion. Middle schoolers, stay here till communion's over. And now Eric. Good morning. Um, as Pastor Kit said, my name is Eric Travis. I am the Missioner for Youth and Young Adults for the Diocese of Michigan. Um, and things are going really great in this transition time. I want you to know that. Um, is that there is not a, a reason to be concerned or worried or any of that, in case you were, and hopefully I didn't put that into your mind to be that way, uh, <laughs> that you weren't. Um, it, it, transition is always uh, an interesting time. Uh, the work that the Ministry for Youth and Young Adults does is to provide opportunities for young people uh, to experience God, uh, to offer ways in which they can continue or to first-time experience or multiple-times experience and share the love of God uh, with each other, with others, um, and, and especially with the community at large. So what we do in the diocese is not take your kids away, um, but offer an additional opportunity. And there are many different ways in which we do that through uh, programs such as our Happening and New Beginnings, which is our retreat weekends. We offer um, things such as uh, mission trips, uh, experiences for growth that are happening in Detroit, or we're also doing an international mission experience this summer to the Dominican Republic. Uh, and we continue to find ways um, that are additional opportunities for our youth and our young adults, uh, as I said, to experience and share the love of God. Um, always looking for not only youth and young adults to be a part of this, but other adults, those of us that are not quite so young, uh, to help out and to be uh, part of these young people's lives. Uh, I'm a firm believer that our young people succeed when they have adults in addition to their parents as a part of their spiritual and uh, uh, growing lives in God and with each other. Is that enough? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eric. You know, we're out in the hinterlands. We're very far away from diocesan headquarters down in Detroit, so we're always grateful to see someone from the diocese. Thank you for being with us. I only see, these guys get to see you, yes. Yeah, we do um, provide office space for diocesan staff, and a different member of the diocesan staff works out of All Saints once a week, so that's very nice. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God.
are worthy of glory and praise. Glory and glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. By your will, you were created and have been. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation. But we turned against you and betrayed your trust and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood we are us. By his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory and their unending. Christ our God. 
Serve the Lord. Hallelujah. 